Section 22 of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac. Translated by Catherine Prescott warmly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 2, Chapter 5 The Alchemists. Again absorbed in thought, Charles the Ninth made her no answer. He was idly flicking crumbs of bread from his doublet and breeches. Your science cannot change the heavens or make the sun to shine, monsieur said at last, pointing to the curtains, which the great atmosphere of Paris darkened. Our science can make the skies what we like, sire, replied Lorenzo Ruggiero. The weather is always fine for those who work in a laboratory by the light of a furnace. That is true, said the king. Well, father, he added, using an expression familiar to him when addressing old men, explain to us clearly the object of your studies. What will guarantee our safety? The word of a king, replied Charles the Ninth, whose curiosity was keenly excited by the question. Lorenzo Ruggiero seemed to hesitate, and Charles the Ninth cried out, What hinders you? We are here alone. But is the king of France here? asked Lorenzo. Charles reflected an instant and then answered, No. The imposing old man then took a chair and seated himself. Cosmo, astonished at this boldness, dared not imitate it. Charles the Ninth remarked with cutting sarcasm, The king is not here, monsieur, but a lady is, whose permission it was your duty to await. He whom you see before you, madame, said the old man, is as far above kings as kings are above their subjects. You will think me courteous when you know my powers. Hearing these audacious words with Italian emphasis, Charles and Marie looked at each other, and also at Cosmo, who, with his eyes fixed on his brother, seemed to be asking himself, how does he intend to get us out of the danger in which we are? In fact, there was but one person present who could understand the boldness and the art of Lorenzo Ruggiero's first step, and that person was neither the king nor his young mistress, on whom that great seer had already flung the spell of his audacity. It was Cosmo Ruggiero, his wily brother though superior himself to the ablest men at court, perhaps even to Catherine de' Medici herself, the astrologer always recognized his brother Lorenzo as his master. Buried in studious solitude, the old servant weighed and estimated sovereigns, most of whom were worn out by perpetual turmoil of politics, the crises of which at this period came so suddenly and were so keen, so intense, so unexpected. He knew their ennui, their latitude, their disgust with things about them. He knew the ardour with which they sought what seemed to them new or strange or fantastic. Above all, how they loved to enter some unknown intellectual region to escape their endless struggle with men and events. To those who have exhausted statecraft, nothing remains but the realm of pure thought. Charles V proved this by his abdication. Charles the Ninth who wrote sonnets and forged blades to escape the exhausting cares of an age in which both throne and king were threatened, to whom royalty had brought only cares and never pleasures, was likely to be roused to a high pitch of interest by the bold denial of his power thus uttered by Lorenzo. Religious doubt was not surprising in an age when Catholicism was so violently arraigned, but the upsetting of all religion, given as the basis of a strange mysterious art, would surely strike the king's mind, and drag it from its present preoccupations. The essential thing for the two brothers was to make the king forget his suspicions by turning his mind to new ideas. The Ruggieri were well aware that their stake in this game was their own life, and the glances, so humble and yet so proud, which they exchanged with the searching suspicious eyes of Marie and the king, were a scene in themselves. Sire, said Lorenzo Ruggiero, you have asked me for the truth, but to show the truth in all her nakedness, I must also show you and make you sound the depths of the well from which she comes. I appeal to the gentleman and the poet to pardon words which the eldest son of the church might take for blasphemy. I believe that God does not concern himself with human affairs. Though determined to maintain a kingly composure, Charles the Ninth could not repress a motion of surprise. Without that conviction, I should have no faith whatever in the miraculous work to which my life is devoted. To do that work I must have this belief, and if the finger of the god guides all things, then I am a madman. Therefore let the king understand once for all that this work means a victory to be won over the present course of nature. 
I am an alchemist, sire, but do not think, as the common-minded do, that I seek to make gold. The making of gold is not the object but an incident of our researches. Otherwise our toil could not be called the great work. The great work is something far loftier than that. If, therefore, I were forced to admit the presence of God in matter, my voice must logically command the extinction of furnaces kept burning throughout the ages. But to deny the direct action of God in the world is not to deny God. Do not make that mistake. We place the creator of all things far higher than the sphere to which religions have degraded him. Do not accuse of atheism those who look for immortality. Like Lucifer, we are jealous of our God, and jealousy means love. Though the doctrine of which I speak is the basis of our work, all our disciples are not imbued with it. Cosmo, said the old man, pointing to his brother, Cosmo is devout. He pays for masses for the repose of our father's soul, and he goes to hear them. Your mother's astrologer believes in the divinity of Christ, in the Immaculate Conception, in transubstantiation. He believes also in the Pope's indulgences, and in hell, and in a multitude of such things. His hour has not yet come. I have drawn his horoscope. He will live to be almost a centenarian. He will live through two more reigns, and he will see two kings of France assassinated. Who are they? asked the king. The last of the Valois and the first of the Bourbons, replied Lorenzo. But Cosmo shares my opinion. It is impossible to be an alchemist and a Catholic, to have faith in a despotism of man of a matter, and also in the sovereignty of the divine. Cosmo to die a centenarian, explained the king with his terrible frown of the eyebrows. Yes, sire, replied Lorenzo with authority, and he will die peaceably in his bed. If you have power to foresee the moment of your death, why are you ignorant of the outcome of your researches? asked the king. Charles the Knight smiled as he said this, looking triumphantly at Marie Touchet. The brothers exchanged a rapid glance of satisfaction. He begins to be interested, thought they. We are saved. Our prognostics depend on the immediate relations which exist at the time between man and nature. But our purpose itself is to change those relations entirely, replied Lorenzo. The king was thoughtful. But if you are certain of dying, you are certain of defeat, he said at last. Like our predecessors, replied Lorenzo, raising his hand and letting it fall again with an emphatic and solemn gesture, which presented visibly the grandeur of his thought. But your mind has bounded to the confines of the matter, sire. We must return upon our steps. If you do not know the ground on which our edifice is built, you may well think it doomed to crumble with our lives, and so judge the science cultivated from century to century by the greatest among men as the common herd judge of it. The king made a sign of assent. I think, continued Lorenzo, that this earth belongs to man. He is the master of it, and he can appropriate to his use all forces and all substances. Man is not a creation issuing directly from the hand of God, but the development of a principle sown broadcast into the infinite of ether, from which millions of creatures are produced, different beings in different worlds, because the conditions surrounding life are varied. Yes, sire, the subtle element which we call life takes its rise beyond the visible worlds. Creation divides that principle according to the centres into which it flows, and all beings, even the lowest, share it, taking so much as they can take of it at their own risk and peril. It is for them to protect themselves from death. The whole purpose of alchemy lies there, sire. If man, the most perfect animal on this globe, bore within himself a portion of the divine, he would not die, but he does die. To solve this difficulty, Socrates and his school invented the soul. I, the successor of so many great and unknown kings, the rulers of this science, I stand for the ancient theories, not the new. I believe in the transformations of matter which I see, and not in the possible eternity of a soul which I do not see. I do not recognize that world of the soul. If such a world existed, the substances whose magnificent conjunction produced your body and are so dazzling in that of Madame would not resolve themselves after your death, each into its own element, water to water, fire to fire, metal to metal, just as the elements of my coal, which burned, returned to their primitive molecules if you believe that a certain part of us survives we do not survive for all that makes our actual being perishes now it is this actual being that i am striving to continue beyond the limit assigned to life it is our present transformation to which i wish to give a greater duration why the trees live for centuries but man lives only years 
though the former are passive the others active the first motionless and speechless the others are gifted with language and emotion no created thing should be superior in this world to man either in power or in duration already we are widening our perceptions for we look into the stars therefore we ought to be able to lengthen the duration of our lives i place life before power what good is power if life escapes us a wise man should have no other purpose than to seek not whether he has some other life within him but the secret springs of his actual form in order that he may prolong its existence at his will that is the desire which has whitened my hair but i walk boldly in the darkness marshalling to the search all those great intellects that share my faith life will some day be ours ours to control ah but how said the king rising hastily the first condition of our faith being that the earth belongs to man you must grant me that point said lorenzo so be it said charles de valois already under the spell then sire if we take god out of this world what remains man let us therefore examine our domain the material world is composed of elements these elements are themselves principles these principles resolve themselves into an ultimate principle endowed with motion the number three is the formula of creation matter motion product stop cried the king what proof is there of this do you not see the effects replied lorenzo we have tried in our crucibles the acorn which produces the oak and the embryo from which grows a man from this tiny substance results a single principle to which some force some movement must be given since there is no overruling creator this principle must give to itself the outward forms which constitute our world for this phenomenon of life is the same everywhere yes for metals as for human beings for plants as for men life begins in an imperceptible embryo which develops itself a primitive principle exists let us seize it at the point where it begins to act upon itself where it is a unit where it is a principle before taking definite form a cause before being an effect we must see it single without form susceptible of clothing itself with all the outward forms we shall see it take when we are face to face with this atomic particle which we shall have caught its movement at the very instant of motion then we shall know the law thenceforth we are the masters of life masters who can impose upon that principle the form we choose with gold to win the world and the power to make for ourselves centuries of life in which to enjoy it that is what my people and i are seeking all our strength all our thoughts are strained in that direction nothing distracts us from it one hour wasted on any other passion is a theft committed against our true grandeur just as you have never found your hounds relinquishing the hunted animal or failing to be in at the death so i have never seen one of my patient disciples diverted from this great quest by the love of woman or a selfish thought if an adept seeks power and wealth the desire is instigated by our needs he grasps a treasure as a thirsty dog laps water while he swims a stream because his crucibles are in need of a diamond to melt or an ingot of gold to reduce to powder to each his own work one seeks the secret of vegetable nature he watches the slow life of plants he notes the parity of motion among all the species and the parity of their nutrition he finds everywhere the need of sun and air and water to fecundate and nourish them another scrutinizes the blood of animals a third studies the laws of universal motion and its connection with celestial revolutions nearly all are eager to struggle with the intractable nature of metal for while we find many principles in other things we find all metals like unto themselves in every particular hence a common error as to our work behold these patient indefatigable athletes ever vanquished ever returning to the combat humanity sir is behind us as the huntsman is behind your hounds she cries to us make haste neglect nothing sacrifice all even a man ye who sacrifice yourselves hasten hasten beat down the arms of death mine enemy yes sire we are inspired by a hope which involves the happiness of all coming generations we have buried many men and what men dying of this search setting foot in this career we cannot work for ourselves we may die without discovering the secret and our death 
is that of those who do not believe in another life. It is this life that we have sought and failed to perpetuate. We are glorious martyrs. We have the welfare of the race at heart. We have failed, but we live again in our successors. As we go through this existence, we discover secrets with which we endow the liberal and the mechanical arts. From our furnaces gleam lights which illumine industrial enterprises and perfect them. Gunpowder issued from our alembics. Nay, we have mastered the lightning. In our persistent vigils lie political revolutions. Can this be true? cried the king, springing once more from his chair. Why not? said the Grand Master of the New Templars. Tradidit mundum disputationibus. God has taken us the earth. Hear this once more. Man is master here below. Master is his. All forces, all means are at his disposal. Who created us? Motion. What power maintains life in us? Motion. Why cannot science seize the secret of that motion? Nothing is lost here below. Nothing escapes from our planet to go elsewhere. Otherwise the stars would stumble over each other. The waters of the deluge are still with us in their principle, and not a drop is lost. Around us, above us, beneath us, are to be found the elements from which have come innumerable hosts of men who have crowded the earth before and since the deluge. What is the secret of our struggle? To discover the force that disunites, and then, then, we shall discover that which binds. We are the product of a visible manufacture. When the waters covered the globe, men issued from them who found the elements of their life in the crust of the earth, in the air, and in the nourishment derived from them. Earth and air possess, therefore, the principle of human transformations. Those transformations take place under our eyes, by means of that which is also under our eyes. We are able, therefore, to discover that secret, not limiting the effort of the search to one man or to one age, but to devoting humanity in its duration to it. We are engaged hand to hand in a struggle with matter, into whose secret I, the grand master of our order, seek to penetrate. Christophe Columbus gave a world to the King of Spain. I seek an ever-living people for the King of France. Standing on the confines which separate us from a knowledge of material things, a patient observer of atoms, I destroy forms, I dissolve the bonds of combinations. I imitate death that I may learn how to imitate life. I strike incessantly at the door of creation, and I shall continue so to strike until the day of my death. When I am dead, the knocker will pass into other hands, equally persistent with those of the mighty men who handed it to me. Fabulous and uncomprehended beings, like Prometheus, Ixion, Adonis, Pan, and others, who have entered into the religious beliefs of all countries and all ages, prove to the world that the hopes we now embody were born with the human races. Chaldea, India, Persia, Egypt, Greece, the Moors, have transmitted from one to another magic the highest of all the occult sciences, which holds within it, as a precious deposit, the fruits of the studies of each generation. In it lay the tie that bound the grand and majestic institution of the Templars. Sire, when one of your predecessors burned the Templars, he burned men only, their secret lived. The reconstruction of the temple is a vow of an unknown nation, a race of daring seekers, whose faces are turned to the orient of life. All brothers, all inseparable, all united by one idea, and stamped with the mark of toil. I am the sovereign leader of that people, sovereign by election, not by birth. I guide them onward to a knowledge of the essence of life. Grand master, red cross bearers, companions, adepts, we forever follow the imperceptible molecule which still escapes our eyes. But soon we shall make ourselves eyes more powerful than those which nature has given us. We shall attain to a sight of the primitive atom, the corpuscular element so persistently sought by the wise and learned of all ages who have preceded us in the glorious search. Sire, when a man is astride of that abyss, when he commands bold divers like my disciples, all other human interests are as nothing. Therefore, we are not dangerous. Religious disputes and political struggles are far away from us. We have passed beyond and above them. No man takes others by the throat when his whole strength is given to a struggle with nature. Besides, in our science, results are perceivable. We can measure effects and predict them, whereas all things are uncertain and vacillating in the struggles of men and their selfish interests. We decompose the diamond in our crucibles, and we shall make diamonds. We shall make gold. We shall impel vessels, as they have at Barcelona, with fire and a little water. We test the wind, and we shall make wind. We shall make light, 
we shall renew the face of empires with new industries but we shall never debase ourselves to mount a throne to be crucified by the peoples in spite of his strong determination not to be taken in by italian wiles the king together with his gentle mistress was already caught and snared by the ambiguous phrases and doublings of this pompous and humbugging loquacity the eyes of the two lovers showed how their minds were dazzled by the mysterious riches of power thus displayed they saw as it were a series of subterranean caverns filled with gnomes at their toil the impatience of their curiosity put to flight all suspicion but cried the king if this be so you are great statesmen who can enlighten us no sire said lorenzo naively why not asked the king sire it is not given to any man to foresee what will happen when thousands of men are gathered together we can tell what one man will do how long he will live whether he will be happy or unhappy but we cannot tell what the collection of wills may do and to calculate the oscillations of their selfish interests is more difficult still for interests are men plus things we can in solitude see the future as a whole and that is all the protestantism that now torments you will be destroyed in turn by its material consequences which will turn to theories in due time europe is at the present moment getting the better of religion to-morrow it will attack royalty then the saint bartholomew was a great conception yes sire for if the people triumph it will have a saint bartholomew of its own when religion and royalty are destroyed the people will attack the nobles after the nobles the rich when europe has become a mere troop of men without consistence or stability because without leaders it will fall a prey to brutal conquerors twenty times already has the world seen that sight and europe is now preparing to renew it ideas consume the ages as passions consume men when man is cured humanity may possibly cure itself science is the essence of humanity and we are its pontiffs who so concerns himself about the essence cares little about the individual life to what have you attained so far asked the king we advance slowly but we lose nothing that we have won then you are the king of sorcerers retorted the king piqued at being of no account in the presence of this man the majestic grand master of the rosicrucians cast a look on charles the ninth which withered him you are the king of men he said i am the king of ideas if we were sorcerers you would already have burned us we have had our martyrs but by what means are you able to cast nativities persisted the king how did you know that the man who came to your window last night was king of france what power authorized one of you to tell my mother the fate of her three sons can you grand master of an art which claims to mould the world can you tell me what m my mother is planning at this moment yes sire this answer was given before cosmo could pull his brother's robe to enjoin silence do you know why my brother the king of poland has returned yes sir why to take your place our most cruel enemies are our nearest in blood exclaimed the king violently rising and walking about the room with hasty steps kings have neither brothers nor sons nor mothers coligny was right my murderers are not among the huguenots but in the louvre you are either impostors or regicides jacob called solen sire said marie touche to what you have, you have your word as a gentleman you wanted to taste of the fruit of the tree of knowledge do not complain of its bitterness the king smiled with an expression of bitter self-contempt he thought his material royalty petty in the presence of the august intellectual royalty of lorenzo ruggiero charles the ninth knew that he could scarcely govern france but this grand master of rosicrucians ruled a submissive and intelligent world answer me truthfully i pledge my word as a gentleman that your answer in case it confesses dreadful crimes shall be as if it were never uttered resumed the king do you deal with poisons to discover that which gives life we must also have full knowledge of that which kills do you possess the secret of many poisons yes sire in theory but not in practice we understand all poisons but do not use them has my mother asked you for any said the king breathlessly sire replied lorenzo queen catherine is too able a woman to employ such means she knows that the sovereign who poisons dies by poison the borgias also bianca capello grand duchess of tuscany are noted examples of the dangers of that miserable resource all things are known at courts there can be no concealment it may be possible to kill a poor devil but what is the good of that but to aim at great men cannot be done secretly who shot coligny 
It could only be you, or the Queen Mother, or the Guises. Not a soul is doubtful of that. Believe me, poison cannot be twice used with impunity in statecraft. Princes have successes. As for other men, if, like Luther, they are sovereigns to the power of ideas, the doctrines, their doctrines are not killed by killing them. Queen is from Florence. She knows that poison should never be used except as a weapon of personal revenge. My brother, who has not been parted from her since her arrival in France, knows the grief that Madame Diane caused your mother, but she never thought of poisoning her, though she might easily have done so. What could your father have said? Never had a woman a better right to do it, and she could have done it with impunity. But Madame de Valentinois still lives. But what of those waxen images? asked the king. Sire, said Cosmo, these things are so absolutely harmless that we lend ourselves to the practice of, to satisfy blind passions, just as physicians give bread pills to imaginary invalids. A disappointed woman fancies that by stabbing the heart of a wax figure she has brought misfortunes upon the head of the man who has been unfaithful to her. What harm in that? Besides, it is our revenue. The Pope sells indulgences, says Lorenzo Ruggiero, smiling. As my mother practised these spells with waxen images, what good would such harmless means be to one who has the actual power to do all things? Has Queen Catherine the power to save you at this moment? inquired the king in a threatening manner. Sire, we are not in danger, replied Lorenzo tranquilly. I knew before I came into this house that I should leave it safely, just as I know that the king will be evilly disposed to my brother Cosmo a few weeks hence. My brother may run some danger then, but he will escape it. If the king reigns by the sword, he also reigns by justice, added the old man, alluding to the famous motto on a medal struck for Charles the Ninth. You know all, and you know that I shall die soon, which is very well, said the king, hiding his anger under nervous impatience. But how will my brother die, he whom you say is to be Henri the Third, by a violent death? And the Duc d'Alencon, he will not reign. Then Henri de Bourbon will be king of France? Yes, sire. How will he die? By a violent death. When I am dead, what will become of madame? asked the king, motioning to Marie Touche. Madame de Belleville will marry, sire. You are impostors, cried Marie Touche. Send them away, sire. Dearest Ruggieri, of my word as a gentleman, replied the king, smiling. Will madame have children? he continued. Yes, sire, and madame will live to be more than eighty years old. Shall I order them to be hanged? said the king to his mistress. But about my son, the Comte d'Auvergne, continued, going to the next room to fetch the child. Why did you tell him I should marry? said Marie to the two brothers, the moment they were alone. Madame, replied Lorenzo with dignity, the king bound us to tell the truth, and we have told it. Is that true? she exclaimed. As true as it is that the governor of the city of Orléans is madly in love with you. But I do not love him, she cried. That is true, madame, replied Lorenzo, but your horoscope declares that you will marry the man who is in love with you at the present time. Can you not lie a little for my sake, she said, smiling, for if the king believes your predictions? Is it not also necessary that we should believe our innocence? interrupted Cosmo with a wily glance at the young favourite. The precautions taken against us by the king have made us think during the time we have spent in your charming jail that the occult sciences have been introduced to him. Do not feel uneasy, replied Marie. I know him. His suspicions are at an end. We are innocent, said the Grand Master of the Rosicrucians proudly. So much the better for you, said Marie, for your laboratory and your retorts and files are now being searched by order of the king. The brothers looked at each other, smiling. Marie Touche took that smile for one of innocence, though it really signified, poor fools, can they suppose that if we brew poisons, we do not hide them? Where are the king's searchers? In Rene's laboratory, replied Marie. Again the brothers glanced at each other with a look which said, The Hotel de Soissons is inviolable. The king had so completely forgotten his suspicions that when as he took his boy in his arms, Jacob gave him a note from Chapelain, he opened it with the certainty of finding in his physician's report that nothing had been discovered in the laboratory but what related exclusively to alchemy. Will he live a happy man? asked the king, presenting his son to the two alchemists. That is a question which concerns Cosmo replied Lorenzo, signing his brother. Cosmo took the tiny hands of the child and examined it carefully. Monsieur, said Charles the Ninth to the old man, 
if you find it necessary to deny the existence of the soul in order to believe in the possibility of your enterprise will you explain to my why you should doubt what your power does thought which you seek to nullify is the certainty the torch which lights your researches ha ha is not the motion of a spirit within you where you deny such motion cried the king pleased with his argument and looking triumphantly at his mistress thought replied lorenzo ruggiero is the exercise of an inward sense just as the faculty of seeing several objects and noticing their size and colour is an effect of sight it has no connection with what people choose to call another life thought is a faculty which ceases with the forces which produced it when we cease to breathe you are logical said the king surprised but alchemy must therefore be an atheistical science a materialist science sire which is a very different thing materialism is the outcome of indian doctrines transmitted through the mysteries of isis to chaldea and egypt and brought to greece by pythagoras one of the demigods of humanity his doctrine of reincarnation is the mathematics of materialism the vital law of its phases to each of the different creations which form the terrestrial creation belongs the power of retarding the movement which sweeps on the rest alchemy is the science of sciences cried charles the ninth enthusiastically i want to see you at work whenever it pleases you sire you cannot be more interested than madame the queen mother ah so this is why she cares for you exclaimed the king the house of medici has secretly protected our search for more than a century sire said cosmo this child will live nearly a hundred years he will have trials nevertheless he will be happy and honoured because he has in his veins the blood of the valois i will go and see you in your laboratory messieurs said the king his good humour quite restored you may go now the brothers bowed to marie and to the king and then withdrew they went down the steps of the portico gravely without looking or speaking to each other neither did they turn their faces to the windows as they crossed the courtyard feeling sure that the king's eye watched them but as they passed sideways out of the gate into the street they looked back and saw charles the ninth gazing after them from a window when the alchemist and the astrologer were safely in the rue de l'autruche they cast their eyes before and behind them to see if they were followed or overheard then they continued their way to the moat of the louvre without uttering a word once there however feeling themselves securely alone lorenzo said to cosmo in the tuscan italian of that day a for did you how we have fooled him much good may it do him let him make what he can of it said cosmo we have given him a helping hand whether the queen pays it back to us or not some days after this scene which struck the king's mistress as forcibly as it did the king marie suddenly exclaimed in one of those moments when the soul seems as it were disengaged from the body in the plenitude of happiness charles i understand lorenzo ruggiero but did you observe that cosmo said nothing true said the king struck by that sudden light after all there was as much falsehood as truth in what they said those italians are as supple as the silk they weave this suspicion explains the rancour which the king showed against cosmo when the trial of la mole and coquenard took place a few weeks later finding him one of the agents of that conspiracy he thought the italians had tricked him for it was proved that his mother's astrologer was not exclusively concerned with stars the powder of projection and the primitive atom lorenzo had by that time left the kingdom in spite of the incredulity which most persons show in these matters the event which followed the scene we have narrated confirmed the predictions of the ruggieri the king died within three months charles de gondi followed charles the ninth to the grave as had been foretold to him jestingly by his brother the marechal de retz a friend of the ruggieri who believed in their predictions marie touchet married charles de balzac marquis d'ontagu the governor of orleans by whom she had two daughters the most celebrated of these daughters the half-sister of the comte d'auvergne was the mistress of henri the fourth and it was she who endeavoured at the time of byron's conspiracy to be put her brother on the throne of france by driving out the bourbons the comte d'auvergne who became the duc de goulême lived into the reign of louis the fourteenth he coined money on his estates and altered the inscriptions but louis the fourteenth let him do as he pleased out of respect for the blood of the valois Cosmo Ruggiero lived till the middle of the reign of Louis XIII. He witnessed the fall of the house of Medici in France, also that of the Concini. History has taken pains to record that he died an atheist, that is, a materialist. The Marquis d'Antagou was over eighty when she died. The famous Comte de Saint-Germain, who 
who made so much noise under Louis the Fourteenth, was a pupil of Lorenzo and Cosmo Ruggiero. This celebrated alchemist lived to be one hundred and thirty years old, an age which some biographers give to Marion de Lorme. He must have heard from the Ruggieri the various incidents of the Saint Bartholomew and of the reigns of the Valois kings, which he afterwards recounted in the first person singular as though he had played a part in them. The Comte de Saint Germain was the last of the alchemists who knew how to clearly explain their science, but he left no writings. The cabalistic doctrine presented in this study is that taught by this mysterious personage. And here, behold a strange thing. Three lives, that of the old man from whom I have obtained these facts, that of the Comte de Saint Germain, and that of Cosmo Ruggiero, suffice to cover the whole of European history from Francois I to Napoleon. Only fifty such lives are needed to reach back to the first known period of the world. What are fifty generations for the study of the mysteries of life? said the Comte de Saint Germain. Section twenty three of Catherine de Medici by Honor de Balzac. Translated by Catherine Prescott Wormley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book three. Two dreams. In seventeen eighty six, Baudard de Saint James, treasurer of the navy, excited more attention and gossip as to his luxury than any other financier in Paris. At this period he was building his famous folie at Noyilly, and his wife had just bought a set of feathers to crown the tester of her bed, the price of which had been too great for even the queen to pay. Baudard owned the magnificent mansion in the palace of Vendôme, which the fermier général d'Ange had lately been forced to leave. That celebrated Epicurean was now dead, and on the day of his internment, his intimate friend, M. de Bivre, raised a laugh by saying that he could now pass through the place Vendôme without danger. This allusion to the hellish gambling which went on in the dead man's house was his only funeral oration. The house is opposite to the Chancellerie. To end in a few words the history of Baudard, he became a poor man, having failed for fourteen millions after the bankruptcy of the Ponce de Guemini. The stupidity showed in not anticipating that Saint-Rémy's disaster, to use the expression of Le Bon Pandere, was the reason why no notice was taken of his misfortunes. He died, like Beauvalet, Bourret, and so many others, in a garret. Madame Baudard de saint James was ambitious, and professed to receive none but persons of quality at her house, an old absurdity which is ever new. To her thinking, even the parliamentary judges were of small account. She wished for titled persons in her salons, or, at all events, those who had the right of entrance at court. To say that many cordon bleu were seen at her house would be false, but it is quite certain that she managed to obtain the goodwill and civilities of several members of the house of Rohan, as well as proved later in the affair of the too celebrated diamond necklace. One evening, it was, I think, in August 1786, I was much surprised to meet, in the salons of this lady, so exacting in the matter of gentility, two new faces which struck me as belonging to men of inferior social position. She came to me presently in the embouchure of a window, where I had ensconced myself. Tell me, I said to her with a glance toward one of the newcomers, who and what is that queer species? Why do you have that kind of thing here? He is charming. Do you see him through a prism of love? Or am I blind? You are not blind, she said laughing. The man is as ugly as a caterpillar but he has done me the most immense service a woman can receive from a man. As I looked at her rather maliciously, she hastened to add, He's a physician, and he has completely cured me of those odious red blotches which spoiled my complexion and made me look like a peasant woman. I shrugged my shoulders with disgust. He is a charlatan. No, she said. He is the surgeon of the court pages. He has a fine intellect. I assure you. In fact, he is a writer and a very learned man. Evans, if his style resembles his face, I said scoffingly. But who is the other? What other? That spruce, affected little popinjay over there who looks as if he has been drinking of rejuice. He is a rather well-born man, she replied, just arrived from some province, I forget which, or from Artois. He has sent here to conclude an affair in which the Cardinal de Rohan is interested, and his eminence in person had just presented him to Monsieur de saint jean It seems they have both chosen my husband as arbitrator. The provincial didn't show his wisdom in that, but fancy what simpletons the people who sent him here must be to trust a case to a man of his sort. 
He is as meek as a sheep and as timid as a girl. His eminence is very kind to you. What is the nature of the affair? Oh, a question of three hundred thousand francs. Then the man is a lawyer, he said with a slight shrug. Yes, she replied. Some confused by this humiliating avowal, Madame Bodard returned to her place at a faro table. All the tables were full. I had nothing to do, no one to speak to, and I had just lost two thousand crowns to Monsieur de Laval. I flung myself on a sofa near the fireplace. Presently, if there was ever a man on earth most utterly astonished, it was I, when, on looking up, I saw, seated on another sofa on the opposite side of the fireplace, Monsieur de Calon, the Comptroller General. He seemed to be dozing, or else he was buried in one of those deep meditations which overtake statesmen. When I pointed out the famous minister to Beaumarchais, who happened to come near me at the moment, the father of Figaro explained the mystery of his presence in that house without uttering a word. He pointed first at my head, then at Baudard, with a malicious gesture which consisted in turning to each of us two fingers of his hand, while he kept the others doubled up. My first impulse was to rise and say something rousing to Galon. Then I paused, first because I thought of a trick I could play the statesman, and secondly because Beaumarchais caught me familiarly by the hand. Oh, why do you do that, monsieur? I said. He winked at the comptroller. Don't wake him, he said in a low voice. A man is happy when asleep. Pray is sleep a financial scheme, I whispered. Indeed, yes, said Calon, who had guessed our words from the mere motion of our lips. Would to God we could sleep long, and then the awakening you are about to see would never happen. Monseigneur, said the dramatist, I must thank you. For what? Monsieur de Merbeau has started for Berlin. I don't know whether we might not both have to end ourselves in that affair of leisure. You have too much memory and too little gratitude, replied the minister, annoyed at having one of his secrets divulged in my presence. Oh, possibly, said Beaumarchais, cut to the quick, but I have millions that can balance many a score. Calon pretended not to hear. It was long past midnight when the play ceased. Supper was announced. There were ten of us at table. Baudard and his wife, Calon, Beaumarchais, the two strange men, Two pretty women, whose names I will not give here, a fermier general, la voisier, and myself. Out of thirty guests who were in the salon when I entered it, only these ten remained. The two queer species did not consent to stay until they were urged to do so by Madame Baudard, who probably thought she was paying her obligations to the surgeon by giving him something to eat and pleasing her husband, with whom she appeared, I don't precisely know why, to be coquetting by inviting the lawyer. The supper began by being frightfully dull. The two strangers and the fermier general pressed us. I made a sign to Beaumarchais to intoxicate the son of Esquibulapius, who sat on his right, giving him to understand that I would do the same by the lawyer who was next to me. As there seemed no other way to amuse ourselves, and it offered a chance to draw out the two men, who were already sufficiently singular, Monsieur de Calonne smiled at our project. The ladies present also shared in the bacchanal conspiracy, and the wine of Sillery crowned our glasses again and again with its silvery foam. The surgeon was easily managed, but at the second glass, which I offered to my neighbour the lawyer, he told me with a frigid politeness of a usurer that he should drink no more. At this instant, Madame de saint gemme chanced to introduce, I scarcely know how, the topic of the marvellous suppers to the Comte de Cagliostro, given by the Cardinal de Rouen. My mind was not very attentive to what the mistress of the house was saying, because I was watching with extreme curiosity the pinched and livid face of my little neighbour whose principal feature was a turned-up and at the same time pointed nose, which made him at times look very like a weasel. Suddenly his cheeks flushed as he caught the words of a dispute between Madame de saint jean and Monsieur de Calonne. "'But I assure you, monsieur,' she was saying with an imperious air, "'that I saw Cleopatra, the queen.' "'I can believe it, madame,' said my neighbour, "'for I myself have spoken to Catherine de Medici.' Oh, oh, exclaimed Monsieur de Calonne. The words uttered by the little provincial were said in a voice of strange sonorousness, if I may be permitted to borrow that expression from the science of physics. This sudden clearness of intonation, coming from a man who had hitherto scarcely spoken, and then in a low and modulated tone, surprised all present exceedingly. Why, he's dogging, said the surgeon, who was now in a satisfactory state of drunkenness, addressing Beaumarchais. His neighbour must have pulled his wires, replied the satirist. My man flushed again as he overheard the words, though they were said in a low voice. 
And pray, how was the late queen? asked Calon, jestingly. I will not swear that the person with whom I supped last night at the house of the Cardinal de Rouen was Catherine de' Medici in person. That miracle would justly seem impossible to Christians as well as to philosophers, said the little lawyer, resting the tips of his fingers on the table and leaning back in his chair as if preparing to make a speech. Nevertheless, I do assert that the woman I saw resembled Catherine de' Medici as closely as though they were twin sisters. She was dressed in a black velvet gown, precisely like that of the queen, in the well-known portrait which belongs to the king. On her head was the pointed velvet coif, which is characteristic of her, and she had the one complexion and the features we all know well. Could not help betraying my surprise to his eminence. The suddenness of the evocation seemed to me all the more amazing because Monsieur de Cagliostro had been unable to divine the name of the person with whom I wished to communicate. I was confounded. The magical spectacle of a supper where one of the illustrious women of past times presented herself took from me my presence of mind. I listened without daring to question. When I aroused myself about midnight from the spell of that magic, I was inclined to doubt my senses. But even this great marvel seemed natural in comparison with the singular hallucination to which I was presently subjected. I don't know in what words I can describe to you the state of my senses, but I declare in the sincerity of my heart I no longer wonder that souls have been found weak enough or strong enough to believe in the mysteries of magic and in the power of demons. For myself, until I am better informed, I regard as possible the apparitions which Cardin and other thaumaturgists describe. His words, said with indescribable eloquence of tone, were of a nature to rouse the curiosity of all present. We looked at the speaker and kept silence. Our eyes alone betrayed our interest, their pupils reflecting the light of the wax candles in the sconces. By dint of observing this unknown little man, I fancied I could see the pores of his skin, especially those of his forehead, emitting an inward sentiment with which he was saturated. This man, apparently so cold and formal, seemed to contain within him a burning altar, the flames of which beat down upon us. I do not know, he continued, if the figure evoked followed me invisibly, but no sooner had my head touched the pillow in my own chamber than I saw once more that grand shade of Catherine rise before me. I felt myself instinctively in a luminous sphere, and my eyes fastened upon the queen with intolerable fixity, so not but her. Suddenly she bent toward me. At these words the ladies present made a unanimous movement of curiosity. But, continued the lawyer, I am not sure that I ought to relate what happened, for though I am inclined to believe it was all a dream, it concerns grave matters. Of religion? asked Beaumarchais. If there is any impropriety, remarked Calon, these ladies will excuse it. It relates to the government, replied the minister. Go on then, said the minister. Voltaire, Diderot, and their fellows of all, they began to tutor us on that subject. Calon became very attentive, and his neighbour, Madame de Genly, rather anxious. The little provincial still hesitated, and Beaumarchais said to him somewhat roughly, Go on, maître, go on. Don't you know that when the laws allow but little liberty, the people seek their freedom in their morals? Thus adjured, the small man told his tale. Whether it was that certain ideas were fermenting in my brain, or that some strange power impelled me, I said to her, Ah, madame, you committed a very great crime. What crime? she asked in a great voice. The crime for which the signal was, was given from the clock of the palace on the 24th of August, I answered. She smiled disdainfully, and a few deep wrinkles appeared on her pallid cheeks. You call that a crime, which was only a misfortune, she said. The enterprise being ill-managed failed. The benefit we expected for France, for Europe, for the Catholic Church was lost. Impossible to foresee that. Our orders were ill-executed. We did not find as many Montlucs as we needed. Posterity will not hold us responsible for the failure of communications, which deprived our work of the unity of movement, which is essential to all great strokes of policy. That was our misfortune. If on the 25th of August not the shadow of a Huguenot had been left in France, I should go down to the uttermost posterity as a noble image of providence. How many, many times of the clear-sighted souls of Sixtus V, Richelieu, Bossuet, reproached me secretly for having failed in that enterprise after having the boldness to conceive it. How many and deep regrets for that failure attended my deathbed. Thirty years after the saint Bartholomew, the evil it might have cured was still in existence. That failure caused ten times more blood to flow in France, and if the massacre of August the 24th had been completed on the 26th, 
the revocation of the edict of nantes in honour of which you have struck medals has cost more it is more blood more money and killed the prosperity of france far more than the three saint bartholomews the tellier with his pen gave effect to a decree which the throne had secretly promulgated since my time but though the vast execution was necessary of the twenty fifth of august fifteen seventy two on the twenty fifth of august sixteen eighty five it was useless under the second son of henri de valois heirs he had scarcely conceived of an offspring under the second son of henri de bourbon that teeming mother had cast her spawn over the whole universe you accuse me of a crime and you put up statues to the son of anne of austria nevertheless he and i attempted the same thing he succeeded i failed but louis the fourteenth found protestants without arms whereas in my reign they had powerful armies statesmen warriors and all germany on their side at these words slowly uttered i felt an inward shudder pass through me i fancied i breathed the fumes of blood from i know not what great mass of victims catherine was magnified she stood before me like an evil genius she sought it seemed to me to enter my consciousness and abide there he dreamed all that whispered beaumanchet he certainly never invented it my reason is bewildered i said to the queen you praise yourself for an act which three generations of men have condemned stigmatized and add she rejoined that historians have been more unjust toward me than my contemporaries none have defended me i rich and all-powerful am accused of ambition i am taxed with cruelty i who have but two deaths upon my conscience even to impartial minds i am still a problem do you believe that i was actuated by hatred that vengeance and fury were the breath of my nostrils she smiled with pity no she continued i was cold and calm as reason itself i condemned the huguenot without pity but without passion there were the rotten fruit in my basket and i cast them out had i been queen of england i should have treated seditious catholics in the same way the life of our power in those days depended on there being but one god one faith one master in the state happily for me i uttered my justification in one sentence which history is transmitting when birago falsely announced to me the loss of the battle of dreux i answered well then we will go to the protestant churches did i hate the reformers no i esteemed them much and i knew them little if i felt any aversion to the politicians of my time it was that base cardinal de lorrain and to his brother the shrewd and brutal soldier who spied upon my every act they were the real enemies of my children they sought to snatch the crown i saw them daily at work and they wore me out if we had not ordered the saint bartholomew the guises would have done the same thing by the help of rome and the monks the league which was powerful only in consequence of my old age would have begun in fifteen seventy three but madame instead of ordering a horrible murder pardon my plainness why not have employed the vast resources of your political power in giving to the reformers those wise institutions which made the reign of henri the fourth so glorious and so peaceful she smiled again and shrugged her shoulders the hollow wrinkles of her pallid face giving her an expression of the bitterest sarcasm the people she said need periods of rest after savage feuds there lies the secret of that reign but henri the fourth committed two irreparable blunders he ought neither to have abjured protestantism nor after becoming a catholic himself should he have left france catholic he alone was in a position to have changed the whole of france without a jar either not a stall or not a conventicle that should have been his motto to leave two bitter enemies two antagonistic principles in a government with nothing to balance them that is the crime of kings it is thus that they sow revolutions to god alone belongs the right to keep good and evil perpetually together in his work but it may be she said reflectively that the sentence was inscribed on the foundation of henri the fourth's policy and it may have caused his death it is impossible that sully did not cast covetous eyes on the vast wealth of the clergy which the clergy did not possess in peace for the nobles robbed them of at least two-thirds of their revenue sully the reformer himself owned abbeys she paused and appeared to reflect but she resumed remember you are asking the niece of a pope to justify her catholicism she stopped again and yet after all she added with a gesture of some levity i should have made a good calvinist do the wise men of your century still think that religion had anything to do with that struggle the greatest which europe has ever seen a vast revolution retarded by little causes which however will not be prevented from overwhelming the world because i failed to smother it a revolution she said giving me a solemn look which is still advancing and which you might consummate yes you who hear me i shuddered 
What, has no one yet understood that the old interests and the new interests seized Rome and Luther as, lo- as mere banners? What, do they not know Louis the Ninth to escape just such a struggle, dragged the population a hundredfold more in number than I destroyed from their homes and left their bones on the sands of Egypt, for which he was made a saint, while I, but I, she added, failed. She bowed her head and was silent for some moments. I no longer beheld a queen, but rather one of those ancient duradices to whom human lives are sacrificed, who on all the pages of the future and exhume the teachings of the past. But soon she uplifted her regal and majestic form. Luther and Calvin, she said, by calling the attention of the burghers to the abuses of the Roman Church, gave birth in Europe to a spirit of investigation which was certain to lead the peoples to examine all things. Examination leads to doubt. Instead of faith, which is necessary to all societies, those two men drew after them in the far distance a strange philosophy, armed with hammers, hungry for destruction. Science sprang sparkling with her specious lights from the bosom of heresy it was far less a question of reforming a church than of winning indefinite liberty for man which is the death of power i saw that the consequence of the successes won by the religionists in the struggle against the priesthood already better armed and more formidable than the crown was the destruction of the monarchical power raised by louis the ninth at such a vast cost upon the ruins of feudality it involved in fact nothing less than the annihilation of religion and royalty on the ruins of which the whole burgher class of europe meant to stand the struggle was therefore war without quarter between the new ideas and the law that is the old beliefs catholics were the emblem of the material interests of royalty of the great lords and of the clergy it was a duel to the death between two giants unfortunately the saint bartholomew proved it to be only a wound remember this because a few drops of blood were spared at that opportune moment torrents were compelled to flow at a later period intellect which soars above a nation cannot escape a great misfortune i mean the misfortune of finding no equals capable of judging it when it succumbs beneath the weight of untoward events my equals are few fools are in the majority that statement explains it all if my name is execrated in france the fault lies with the commonplace minds who form the mass of all generations in the great crises through which i passed the duty of reigning was not the mere giving of audiences reviewing of troops signing of decrees i may have committed mistakes for i was but a woman but why was there then no man who was above this age duke of alba had a soul of iron philip the second was stupefied by catholic belief henri the fourth was a gambling soldier and a libertine the admiral a stubborn mule louis the eleventh lived too soon hushly too late Virtuous or criminal, guilty or not, in the Saint Bartholomew, I accept the onus of it. I stand between these two great men, the visible link of an unseen chain. The day will come when some paradoxical writer will ask if the peoples have not bestowed the title of executioner among their victims. It will not be the first time that humanity has preferred to immolate a god rather than admit its own guilt. You are shedding upon two hundred clowns sacrificed for a purpose the tears you refuse to a generation, a century, a world. You forget that political liberty, the tranquillity of a nation, nay, knowledge itself, are gifts on which destiny has laid a tax of blood. But, I exclaimed, with tears in my eyes, will the nations never be happy at less cost? Truth never leaves her well, but to bathe in the blood which refreshes her, she replied. Christianity, itself the essence of all truth, since it comes from God, was fed by the blood of martyrs, which flowed in torrents, and shall it not ever flow. You will learn this you who are destined to be one of the builders of the social edifice founded by the apostles so long as you level heads you will be applauded but take your trowel in hand begin to reconstruct and your fellows will kill you blood blood the word sounded in my ears like a knell according to you i cried protestantism has the right to reason as you do but catherine had disappeared as if some puff of air had suddenly extinguished the supernatural light which enabled my mind to see that figure whose proportions had gradually become gigantic and then without warning i found within me a portion of myself which adopted the monstrous doctrine delivered by the italian i woke weeping bathed in sweat at the moment when my reason told me firmly in a gentle voice that neither kings nor nations had the right to apply such principles fit only for a world of atheists how would you save a falling monarchy asked beaumarchais god is present replied the little lawyer therefore remarked monsieur de calonne with the inconceivable levity which characterized him 
we have the agreeable resource of believing ourselves the instruments of God, according to the gospel of Bossuet. As soon as the ladies discovered that the tale related only to a conversation between the queen and the lawyer, they had begun to whisper and to show signs of impatience, interjecting now and then little phrases through his speech. How wearisome he is! My dear, when will he finish? Were among those which reached my ear. When the strange little man had ceased speaking, the ladies too were silent. Monsieur Bedard was sound asleep, the surgeon half drunk. Monsieur de Calonne was smiling at the lady next to him. Lavoisier, Beaumarchais, and I alone had listened to the lawyer's dream. The silence at this moment had something solemn about it. The gleam of the candles seemed to me magical. A sentiment bound all three of us by some mysterious tie to that singular little man who made me, strange to say, conceive suddenly the inexplicable influences of fanaticism. Nothing less than the hollow, cavernous voice of Beaumarchais's neighbour, the surgeon, could, I think, have roused me. I too have dreamed, he said. I looked at him more attentively, and a feeling of some strange horror came over me. His livid skin, his features, huge and yet ignoble, gave an exact idea of what you must allow me to call the scum of the earth. A few bluish-black spots were scattered over his face, like bits of mud, and his eyes shot forth an evil gleam. The face seemed perhaps darker, more lowering than it was, because of the white hair, piled like hoar-frost, on his head. That man must have buried many a patient, I whispered to my neighbour, the lawyer. I wouldn't trust him with my dog, he answered. I hate him involuntarily. For my part, I despise him. Perhaps you are unjust, I remarked. Ha, tomorrow he may be as famous as Volange the actor. Monsieur de Calon here motioned us to look at the surgeon with a gesture that seemed to say, I think he'll be very amusing. Did you dream of a queen? asked Beaumarchais. No, I dreamed of a people, replied the surgeon with an emphasis which made us laugh. I was then in charge of a patient whose leg I was to amputate the next day. Did you find the people in the leg of your patient? asked Monsieur de Calon. Precisely, replied the surgeon. How amusing! cried Madame de Genlis. I was somewhat surprised, went on the speaker, without noticing the interruption and sticking his hands into the gussets of his breeches, to hear something talking to me within that leg. I then found I had the singular faculty of entering the being of my patient. Once within his skin I saw a marvellous number of little creatures which moved and thought and reasoned. Some of them lived in the body of the man, others lived in his mind. His ideas were things which were born and grew and died. They were sick and well and gay and sad. They all had special countenances. They fought with each other, or they embraced each other. Some ideas sprang forth and went to live in the world of intellect. I began to see that there were two worlds, two universes, the visible universe and the invisible universe that the earth had, like man, a body and a soul. Nature illumined herself for me. I felt her immensity when I saw the oceans of beings who, in masses and in species, spread everywhere, making one sole and uniform animated matter from the stone of the earth to God. Magnificent vision. In short, I found a universe within my patient. When I inserted my knife into his gangrene leg, I cut into a million of those little beings. Oh, you laugh, madame. Let me tell you that you are eaten up by such creatures. No personalities, interposed Monsieur de Colon. Speak for yourself and for your patient. My patient, frightened by the cries of his amne malcules, wanted to stop the operation, but I went on regardless of his remonstrances, telling him that those evil animals were already gnawing at his bones. He made a stupid movement of resistance, not understanding that what I did was for his good, and my knife slipped aside, entered my own body, and— He is stupid, said Levasseur. No, he is drunk, replied Beaumarchais. But, gentlemen, my dream has a meaning, cried the surgeon. Ho, ho, exclaimed Baudard, waking up. My leg is asleep. Your animalcules must be dead, said his wife. That man has a vocation, announced my little neighbour, who had stared imperturbably at the surgeon while he was speaking. It is to yours, said the ugly man, what the action is to the word, the body to the soul. But his tongue grew thick, his words were indistinct, and he said no more. Fortunately for us, the conversation took another turn. At the end of half an hour, we had forgotten the surgeon of the king's pages, who was fast asleep. Rain was falling in torrents as we left the supper-table. Lawyer is no fool, I said to Beaumarchais. True, but he is cold and dull. You will see, however, that the provinces are still sending us worthy men who take a serious view of political theories and the history of France. It is the leaven which will rise. Is your claret here? asked Madame de saint addressing me. No, I replied, I did not think that I should need it tonight. Madame de saint then rang the bell, 
ordered her own carriage to be brought round, and said to the little lawyer in a low voice, Monsieur de Robespierre, will you do me the kindness to drop Monsieur Moray at his own door, for he is not in a state to go alone. Oh, with pleasure, madame, replied Monsieur de Robespierre, with his finical gallantry. I only wish you had requested me to do something more difficult. End of section 23. End of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac. Recorded by Edmund Bloxham. Find my audio recordings on my new website.